So here we go with the recording and welcome to class. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, so I just, uh, this is actually Alfredo's uh, uh, lecture today, but I just wanted, since this is our first session, I wanted to just take a few minutes to introduce the course a little bit. Uh, Alfredo will give you more details about the plan for the, the whole course and the mechanics of it and um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, issues of tools and software and things like this, and we'll uh, clarify things that I explained during the course that you may not exp you may not understand directly during the lecture. But uh, Alfredo will make that will make everything clear. I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about the 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 history of this, right? Because this is not something that um, we we talk very much about during during lectures, and uh, deep learning really is the 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 descendant of work on, on neural net, which itself is uh, the descendant of work where people try to understand how biological systems kind of organize themselves, uh, particularly self themselves. So going back to the 1940s, two gentlemen on the right, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, came up with the idea that uh, if, you, if you connect very simple uh, computing elements uh, that are essentially what we now call micro computer neurons, binary neurons, uh, you can do logical operations. And if you can do logical operations, you can do reasoning. And so they had the, this hypothesis that uh, essentially the, the brain was a very large, this is not a hypothesis, this is a fact, the brain is a very large uh, network of, uh, of neurons. And those neurons are actually somewhat binary in the brain. They, they either, either turn on with a spike or they, they turn off. And so they say, if you have binary elements, you can, um, you can compute, um, you can do logical calculus. You can uh, do inference, you know, logical computation, and perhaps this is a, a process that the brain, the human brain uses for, for reasoning and, and perhaps the brain in animals. Um, so uh, very soon, um, so simultaneously, Donald Hebb, who is a, a psychologist, uh, came up with um, a proposal for how neurons in the brain uh, change their, by changing the, the strengths of the, the connections between neurons can sort of change their function if you want. And so uh, it was known in, in neuroscience, but the idea that learning proceeds by changing the strength of the connection between neurons um, is, uh, is this idea. And, and had proposed that if two neurons are active at the same time, then the, the connection, the, the synapse that connects them strengthens. And if they're not active at the same time, then it kind of gets depressed. So this is called Hebbian learning. And this, is what, this was sort of a, uh, general idea that a few people kind of reused in the first uh, uh, sort of artificial neural network models. There's a lot of work that I'm not mentioning here, but um, in the 1940s as well, Norbert Wiener founded uh, a, a field, um, a discipline called cybernetics. We don't use that word very much anymore, but it's the, it's the we, we call this now uh, uh, system theory or, or or things like this. There's a lot of subfield of cybernetics now, but uh, but we don't we don't very much use that word anymore. But it's the idea that uh, when you have sort of complex systems in interaction with feedback, you can have sort of very complex phenomena uh, emerging, and um, and so he came up with sort of a, a bit of general uh, a theory for this, uh, and out of that came uh, thoughts about uh, uh, self-organization or auto-organization, if you want to be uh, Latin, and the, this is the idea that if you connect lots and lots of very simple elements with a very simple rule um, to kind of make them compute, they perhaps might be able to self-organize themselves into having a sort of emergent property. And this is something that we observe with biology and with uh, the brain in particular. The elementary components of the brain are very simple in conceptually, uh, but it's their connection, it's their network that uh, uh, gives emergence to things like intelligence. So uh, that was a very mysterious uh, process back then. Um, then in the late 50s, uh, Frank, Frank Rosenblatt, who also was a, psych a psychologist actually, um, came up with uh, a system called the perceptron, an idea. So it's a very simple idea, which is the basis of what we now call supervised running of basically having a, a system that can learn to, for example, classify patterns represented as a vector of uh, numbers or activities or voltages in this case, uh, by adjusting weights, uh, the weights being similar to the synapse, the, the synapses in a, of, a, of a neuron. 
And he was able to demonstrate that uh, such systems that you know basically learn by error correction um, can uh, can learn basic things. This is what you know what we now call the linear classifier, um, and uh, or which is an example of what's called uh, statistical pattern recognition. So, so it's a very simple idea. You show an image to a system. You see if it gives you the right answer. If it gives you the right answer, you do nothing. If it gives you a wrong answer, you adjust the parameters, which are weights of a neuron, uh, so that the answer gets closer to the one you want. And then you keep doing this with uh, thousands of examples. Uh, they didn't have access to uh, computers at the time. So what he did was that he built an analog machine, uh, an electronic machine that basically implemented all this. Um, it, and that was the physical perception. You see pictures of this at the bottom left. Uh, and in fact, one of those pictures is uh, Rosenblatt holding a row of eight uh, weights. The weights were actually potentiometers with a motor, so, that, so it could, they could rotate. So it's basically an electromechanical computer, if you want. We made a replica somehow this past semester. We made a replica, yes. Actually, Philip Schmidt, who's, uh, who's working in, uh, in our lab, made a, kind of a replica of this, but with modern technology, it's much easier. Um, then, uh, almost simultaneously, Bernie Widrow at Stanford came up with a, a slightly uh, different model called Edeline, which is very, very similar in many ways. Um, also a, a basic linear classifier. And around the same time, neuroscientists discovered uh, some basic properties about the architecture of the visual cortex, uh, which turned out to have a big impact several years later, which I'll come back to. So they actually got the Nobel Prize for this. So this was very well known. Uh, I mean, this became very well known and they discovered that neurons in the visual cortex basically look at kind of a small area um, uh, of, of the visual field and many neurons at different places in the visual cortex basically perform the same operation. Uh, the third picture from the left is uh, at the bottom is uh, Hubel and Wiesel. Um, then uh, there's some work on, on all, of the, all of this in the 1960s. And then in 1969, Minsky and Peppert from MIT uh, published a book called Perceptron that actually pointed out the limits of the Perceptron. And, and they said, uh, you know, trying to build intelligent machines from the basic idea of the Perceptron is basically hopeless because of those mathematical limits. And so really that's not the right way to, to go. We should pursue the idea of intelligent machines uh, in some other way, okay? and that basically killed the entire field. So people stopped working on these things uh, in the late 70s. They didn't really stop working on it, they changed the name um, of what they were doing. And, but, but people in, in, in AI who are interested in sort of reproducing the, 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 the process of intelligence, if you want, started working on things that are more based on logic and sort of more classical computer science. What, what was not then yet classical computer science, but what became kind of classical computer science. Um, algorithms, search, uh, logic, you know, things like that, reasoning, and sort of abandoning all the uh, kind of the type of things we, we observe in animals. So this is, uh, again, more pictures of the perceptron at the bottom. Um, now you can reproduce the, the three pictures uh, at the bottom here with about, you know, half a page of PyTorch. Um, but um, back then it was kind of a major undertaking. And then uh, on the right here is Bernie Widrow with the original Adeline, which was also an analog computer where the weights were electrochemical, actually. And the, the, the basic element in those were the, the macular pitch neuron that performs a weighted sum of its inputs where the weights are adaptive and then compares it to a threshold and turns on if, if it's above the threshold, turns off if it's, uh, if it's not. Um, so a little bit more history of what happened uh, afterwards. So, um, it basically, research on neural nets and this kind of stuff kind of pretty much died uh, in the West, at least uh, in the 1970s. There were uh, so people kind of changed the name of what they were doing. Um, you, you know that that became known as statistical pattern recognition, uh, and I'm missing an N here on pattern. Uh, or for some others, Bernie Widrow, for example, renamed what he was doing as adaptive filters, and this turned out to have actually a huge impact on technology. Uh, adaptive filters are used absolutely everywhere today and for uh, data communication, for um, you know, every modem um, has an adaptive filter in it for echo cancellation. So for example, right now, um, if uh, Alfredo talks, uh, the sound comes out of my speakers and it goes back into my microphone. And if it wasn't for echo cancellation, you would, you would hear um, his voice twice. Uh, but echo cancellation is basically an adaptive filter that learns to suppress uh, uh, 
uh, things like that. So you can't have speaker phones without that. You can't have video, interactive video without that. Um, but in Japan, research, uh, which was kind of a slightly separate ecosystem for research, uh, research continued in neural net. Kunumiko Fukushima came up with uh, this thing called the cognitron and the neocognitron, uh, which inspired a lot of people, including me. I kind of started getting interested in, in neural net uh, just around the same time, around 1980. Um, and I was uh, uh, really influenced by, by those papers. Um, uh, he got imp inspired by uh, Hubel and Weasel and tried to kind of have a a, a sort of computer simulation, if you want, of the, 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 the visual cortex, according to the model of uh, Hubel and Weasel. He didn't have proper learning algorithms, so uh, his system was uh, a little uh, uh, brittle, but, um, but that was kind of a pretty heroic uh, 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 attempt. And then in the early 1980s, um, the physicists started getting interested in neural nets, and the physicists really didn't know the whole history of the perceptron. And so there was no kind of uh, bad feeling about uh, kind of working on neural nets like, like uh, engineers and computer scientists uh, had who knew that the perceptron basically had been killed. And it was you know, a, a bad, bad idea to try to publish papers on this. Uh, physicists didn't have those, those, um, uh, uh, those hesitations. And, and so Hubfield came up with um, a, a model which actually had been proposed earlier by, by other people, but he came up with a, a theory for it. This uh, a, a type of uh, recurrent neural net that he showed could be used as associative memories. Again, other people had shown this before, um, Teuvo Kohonen in Finland and uh, Nakano in, uh, in Japan. Uh, but what he showed was that there was a, a mathematical analogy with systems that physicists were interested in uh, called spin glasses. And, uh, and, and that got physicists interested in basically trying to use their methods from statistical physics to explain perhaps how the brain works. Uh, and one of them was Terry Sanofsky. He was actually a student with uh, John Hopfield. Uh, from what he tells me, he's the one who actually got John Hopfield interested in neural nets. Um, and he worked with uh, Jeffrey Hinton um, uh, on a, a model called the Bolson machine. Uh, I found when I was, um, uh, working on this, I, I, I found this, this paper fascinating because this was really the first paper in my mind that allowed a, a system, uh, a neural net to be trained that had hidden units, right? So the main limitations of both Hopfield nets and Perceptron and Adeline and all the previous models was like they were basically single layer systems. Um, every unit is either an input or an output and you only have weights between inputs and outputs. And really the limitation that Minsky and Pepper showed, one of the limitation is that to really sort of have a powerful machine, you need multiple layers. Also machines were the first system, uh. the first learning algorithm that basically allowed uh, training with uh, units that are neither inputs nor outputs. Do you have a question? Okay, no question. Um, then pretty soon, um, uh, the idea of uh, backpropagation uh, came up and it became practical to basically train multilayer neural nets with backpropagation. Uh, this required a major conceptual change, which was to switch from using binary neurons to basically continuous neurons so that they, they, so that they were uh, differentiable, essentially. And uh, a lot of what we talk about during this class um, is really related to this idea of backpropagation. Uh, so that really was a watershed. Uh, it, it spurred a lot of interest in, uh, in the field. And, and a lot of you know the the, the community uh, became fairly large. Uh, the 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 NIPS conference now called NORIPS uh, kind of started uh, around 1987. So this really kind of started the field of, of neural net, restarted the field of neural nets. Um, a few years later, I um, I proposed the uh, idea of convolutional nets, which is basically uh, inspired by the neocognitron and by Hubel and Weasel, uh, but it uses backpropagation for training and. Uh, that sort of allowed um, uh, things like, like you know, handwriting recognition and things like this, and more recently, uh, image recognition. Uh, then there's a number of progress that occurred, which you know may or may not be on everybody's radar, but they are important to me. Uh, Leon Boutou, who's now at Facebook, and Patrick Gallinari in, in, in Paris, uh, uh, um, proposed this idea that you could basically do automatic differentiation. You could build a neural net by assembling modules. And if, if you knew how to propagate gradients to those modules, you could basically compute gradients for any kind of uh, uh, a graph of interconnected modules. And uh, uh, Leon Boutou uh, soon uh, uh, rejoined uh, Bell Labs where I was working. And uh, we started implementing a, a software 
which were called SN at the time, uh, that actually implemented this idea around 1992. And we, we used this for all of work. And it took a long time for the rest of the world to actually realize this was a very <laughs> useful thing. So what you see in PyTorch today and, and, and TensorFlow and various other uh, schemes are essentially derived from this, uh, from this idea, if you want. Um, and SN means? SN means simulator neuronal. So this was sort of a French name that we gave to our neural net simulator, if you want. <laughs> and the paper uh, in French. We <laughs> released an open source uh, in 2002 under the name Lush. It's on SourceForge if you are interested. It's kind of a Lisp, it has a Lisp language at the front end. Um, in the mid 90s, there was uh, interesting work on uh, recurrent net, like uh, Ochreiter and Schmidhuber's uh, long short term memory uh, and, and various other things. Um, uh, interesting work also in speech and handwriting recognition on what's called structure prediction with neural nets, graph transformer nets, which uh, uh, we'll talk about a little bit in this um, in this class as well. And then nothing happened for about 10 years. Um, the you know people lost interest in neural nets. Uh, people in the machine learning community started uh, being more interested in sort of simpler models that basically were single layer, and uh, for reasons that are still mysterious to me. And um, and nothing much happened. Uh, a few things. Yosha Benjo came up with this idea of neural language model in 2003, which turned out to be really pioneering. Uh, there's a lot of work on this. If you have heard of GPT-3, this is basically the descendant of this, if you want. Um, and a lot of models that use NLP today, the neural, neural models for NLP are, are basically very inspired by either this or the last item here, the Colorbay and Weston self-supervised neural net for natural language processing. This is also a very pioneering uh, paper. Uh, you know, 10 years ahead or 15 years ahead of his time uh, of, you know, basically training a, a system to represent text by training it to discriminate uh, good sequences of words from bad sequences of words where you have substituted some words by others, for example. They won the 10-year award, right, on uh, New Rips, I think. They did, yes. Um, uh, was that last year, two years ago, maybe? Uh, two years ago, I think. So it two is, I think. Because their, their original paper was actually earlier than 2010, but their yeah. uh, journal paper, I think, was around 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but then in the mid 2000, uh, Yosha Benjo, Jeff Hinton, and I kind of uh, started a conspiracy to renew the interest of the community in neural nets. And out of this came out this idea that you can sort of pre train a deep neural net, uh, perhaps in a layer wise fashion using autoencoder methods and, and things like that. Uh, in an in a unsupervised or self-supervised manner. And that sort of restarted the interest of the community a little bit into, uh, into neural nets, but only kind of a small community until um, around 2012 when it became clear that convolutional nets, uh, when you run them on GPU and had large, uh, training large uh, number of training samples, basically could beat every, every other technique that were around. So that was really a watershed moment. A lot of people became interested in deep learning around 2013, after the uh, after after this uh, this AlexNet won the co the competition. So this was from uh, Jeff Hinton's group, uh, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Sutskever, and uh, and Jeff Hinton. Um, we also had been working at NYU on on, on convolutional nets for various things, but we were not as fast uh, uh, to implement things on GPU. So our applications were good, but not as spectacular. Um, and then three years later, Ilya Suskever, who was working at Google at the time, um, he now kind of leads uh, OpenAI uh, uh, research branch, uh, showed that you can use neural nets, uh, multi-layer LSTM in this case, for neural machine translation and, and basically match the performance of traditional machine translation system. Um, simultaneously, uh, people at, at, at Facebook AI Research, which was just the beginning of Facebook AI Research at the time, that just existed for a year, uh, Western Chopra and Board uh, showed uh, an idea called memory networks, which basically said like you can have modules in a neural net that are basically associative memories. Um, a year later, uh, Badano uh, Kung Yung Cho, who is a professor here at NYU and Yosho Bencho, um, showed that you could replace this uh, complex LSTM that Ilya Sutskever had shown by a relatively simpler architecture based on the mechanism of uh, the mechanism of attention, where you you have a Basically, multiplicative interactions between uh, between weights that essentially gate uh, can route kind of signals if you want in a complex neural network. And when you com when you combine the memory network idea with this idea of, uh, of 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 attention in sort of a big way, you big you know you build big neural nets with that, you get what's called uh, a transformer architecture, which has basically completely taken over 
uh, the, the, the field of natural language processing and is now actually making inroads as well in, in computer vision. Uh, 2016 was uh, ResNet, which was kind of a, a modification of convolutional net that really made a big difference, could allow convolutional net to be much deeper than they were before and really sort of brought about a big, big progress. So uh, there's a lot more here that is in the blank, uh, more recent history, which you'll hear during the class. And the, the, the class will um, uh, you know, talk about um, the, the, the basic techniques, their sort of practical uh, use and, and how you can uh, uh, you know, uh, put them to practice. And uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say the theory in the sense that we're not gonna uh, demonstrate you know, proof theorems or anything like that, but certainly uh, a lot of mathematical basis uh, for all of this. Um, the style is that uh, in my lectures, I'm generally gonna stay very sort of conceptual. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about things in, in sort of give you an intuition for how things work and give you the, the, the grand ideas. Uh, then the, the actual math behind it and the practice of actually making it work. A lot of this will be covered uh, in, the, in the practicums and, and also sort of in your own uh, personal work. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And uh, hold on, there are questions for you. I, yeah, I go, go ahead with the questions. All right, so you covered like the historical part. What about the other edge? Like what about the future, right? So what are the uh, research you're working on uh, what do you think is going to be a good, you know, direction? Right. We'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about that also in the in the class. So uh, uh, towards the, the you know in the second half. So one big hot topic at the moment is something called self-supervised learning. Uh, so this is really kind of uh, the descendant of this uh, layer-wise unsupervised pre-training for deep network from from 2006. It's kind of the same idea that, uh, and also uh, inspired by the Colbert Western uh, uh, system. And inspired by some work I did also in the 90s on uh, what's called Siamese networks. So it's the idea that you pre-train uh, a neural net not to uh, perform a task in a supervised manner, but you pre-train it to just understand the data without training it for a particular task. Uh, and then you fine tune it on the task that you're interested in. This has revolutionized uh, natural language processing over the last two or three years. It's, it's starting to revolutionize computer vision and certainly a lot of areas where the uh, amount of data that we have, labeled data, is, is, is limited. Um, so self-supervised learning is really kind of the immediate future. This is what you know, a lot of people are working on at the moment. It is making really quick progress. Um, a lot of work is also being devoted to um, basically getting machines to reason. So a lot of what I've talked about here is basically perception, right? We can, what we can do with neural nets is, uh, you know, perhaps what, what animals and humans can do in uh, a very short time without thinking about it, right? So uh, uh, recognizing uh, objects, uh, navigating, you know, uh, things that don't require reasoning. But what about, uh, you know, if you want machines to be able to do long chains of reasoning or plan in advance or things like this, uh, how do we need to kind of modify our architectures so that the machines are able to do this? There's a little bit of that going on in um, all the fields around transformers and, 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 and things like that, but not a huge amount. Uh, memory networks were really an attempt at, uh, at, at sort of allowing machines to reason, access a, a working memory, uh, reason on it, and then change the content of the working memory. Uh, so a lot of recent work on this. I don't think anybody has a complete answer for how you do this, but it's a big challenge to basically try to make reasoning compatible with uh, deep learning, which means gradient-based learning, really. Um, classical methods for reasoning in AI are based on logic, and that's you know discrete and essentially inco incompatible with uh, with learning. So that's kind of a big uh, a big challenge. Uh, there are other challenges which are a little outside of the reach of uh, what we can do at the moment. So things like uh, uh, we know how to train a system to represent uh, percepts uh, like images and text and things like this. We don't know how to train a system to represent action plans in a hierarchical manner, and I think that's uh, a major obstacle also. People are not really working on this at the moment because uh, no one has any good idea of how to do it, but, uh, but that's kind of a third challenge, I would say. So learning without, um, without labels, learning a little bit like humans and animals by observing the world, that's uh, getting machines to be able to do this. That's a major challenge. That's what I'm working on. That's basically the only thing I'm interested in, really, uh, research-wise. Um, getting machines to reason is very, a very interesting topic um, uh, as well. A lot of people are working on this. And then the third topic is uh, 
you know, basically integrating all of this into uh, sort of a autonomous intelligent systems that has an objective, has a model of the world that allows you to predict the consequences of its actions, has a way of uh, deriving a sequence of actions that will optimize its objective and allows you to learn all of this simultaneously. Um, that would be kind of the ultimate uh, intelligent system. We don't know how to put those things together yet. Those are the challenges. So um, have fun with. Uh, yeah, hold on. Wait. Last question. Last question. And sure. so these were like uh, you know interesting direction. What are the instead limitations? And what do you think about quantum computers, non-binary states? That's the last one. Right. Okay. Uh, so I mean, current limitations are are clear. When I when I talk about uh, those topics of research, self-supervised learning, reasoning, etc. Basically, what I say now is that currently systems are not able to do this. Right. With a few exceptions. Um, one big challenge is, uh, you know, can we derive, can we come up with uh, learning uh, uh, paradigms that will allow machines to learn by observation and would allow them to acquire some some level of common sense? No machine has common sense at the moment. Uh, all of AI systems usually has a very narrow uh, intelligence. I'm kind of uh, skeptical about sort of the applications of quantum computing to to machine learning. It's an interesting field. Uh, there are people who are thinking about like the connection between deep, between machine learning, deep learning, and uh, quantum computing, and whether one could be used for for the other. Uh, it's still very much up in the air. Um, it's not entirely clear. There's I mean, there's certainly not going to be any practical uh, consequences in the short term, at least in the next decade. Um, but uh, you know, as a academic research subject, it's uh, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> That okay. Nice. <laughs> All right. So have fun. Thank you again for, for opening the, today, this year, this semester and this year class. Uh, we okay. see you on uh, Wednesday, right? Yeah, same time, Wednesday. same place. Well, there is a different Zoom link, but uh, we all have the access to the calendar. So we, we know where to find you. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Fun. All right. So. Uh, back to us and yes, welcome again. And let's cover a little bit of following up topics, right? So one of the most interesting topics uh, I mean, for you, I think is going to be figuring out how this course works. Right. Uh, and so I share with you already on the, uh, on the, on the, through the announcement, I share the, uh, sort of rules of the, of the class. Uh, you should have already have access to that because again, I guess you're here. So all, all of the people that are here right now have access, right? But, uh, more or less, you're gonna, you see that there are, uh, so maybe we want to cover quickly the, um, let me see the grading part. That is what usually you're very interested. So I will respect that and. <laughs> Uh, but okay, before, before talking about this stuff, right? So, uh, as you can see this class is remote, right? Um, and then, so it's going to be slightly different from how usually we, we held classes in, in person. Uh, every interaction is going to be done through, you know, a camera, a computer and whatever. Uh, and so we still need to be able to communicate at the best of our capabilities, right? So as you have already noticed, uh, what uh, I'm trying to do is going to be like, uh, try to stop Jan as many times as I can, given that we have questions for him. Otherwise he just keeps going and we don't understand Well, we might lose focus and, and, you know, uh, understanding of what's going on. So, uh, whenever there are like, uh, good questions, right? No, no, not just <laughs> whenever we actually have a proper question to ask Jan, uh, we should be writing down on the chat such that we, uh, I understand what, what is the, uh, the, you know, understanding and this, uh, the, the, the pace of the class, if it's too fast, too slow, whatever, and when we can interact, right? So, uh, interaction is the base to, uh, actually get something out of these classes, right? Um, all these uh, classes are recorded, right? I just press the record button. So, um, you know, eventually after, at the end of the class, you will be able to watch again, this. Uh, is the competition I'm going to tell you in a sec. Um, so see all these lessons are recorded. Therefore it means you can rewatch them later, right? Uh, 
this does not mean you can you don't come to class, right? The part that you come to class, it's uh, I think the one of the most important part because you can get much more value out of you know being attend during class and have this kind of interaction. Uh, I will try to have eye contact with you over there on the other side of the screen uh, as much as I can. Um, and again, I will be trying to be interactive uh, for what I can, right? And these look seem to be very effective whenever uh, whenever I've been using like the the chat here. And by you know, I ask to you, you right here. We somehow have a feedback loop, and we are managing to uh, to to stay on the same page. Uh, but you don't have to turn on your camera because again, otherwise, if everyone turns on the camera, you don't see anymore what's going on. I think. All right, so young speed uh, of talking was a bit faster. I I, I know uh, you can watch the video recording and you can slow him down. Uh, it, it was just because he didn't want to, uh, to to steal too much time from from the lab. But okay, this lab is like half gone through. So let's see what we can do. Uh, will be the work with PyTorch. Uh, yeah, of course. I'm I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking about that uh, right now. So yeah, so. Uh, the point is that you, we should be able to learn, right? The point of coming to class is learning. Uh, and to be able to learn, you should be able to keep awake for the most of the class, right? Uh, if, if you, again, if you, if, you, if you go around and eat some ice cream because you're home and whatever, right? You may get distracted, then you don't get any more back on track on whatever is happening. Yes, there are recordings, but again, recordings are just, oh, you're sick one day. Uh, yes, you you don't you don't miss out, right? So recording are like something you may use if you really really cannot take a part of class, right? But otherwise, we should be able to you know make like a, a happy group, happy interactive group. Also, I'm very sarcastic. Okay, I'm just telling this in advance for whoever does not uh, understand or know what sarcasm is. So what is written down in text, textual format is usually uh, the official part. Whatever I say, you know, take it with a pinch of salt as in, you know, I like to joke quite uh, a bit. And so I will say funny things to make you smile and, 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 and laugh. So don't, don't get offended, please. Or like, if you think I'm a jerk, just let me know. You think that it's all good. I will try to be more cautious, right? Whenever I, I interact. Uh, okay, so these are the main points. So yeah, the agreement is that I will, uh, okay, every time you don't understand something I say, right? Just ask me, what did you say? I didn't get it, right? So if you don't get something, at least in my classes, uh, it's usually my fault. I'm not able to communicate with you, right? So my accent is bad. Uh, I haven't slept enough. That's usually very often the case whenever I'm overworked or, you know, something happens. There is, you know, someone ringing the door, you know, I'm at home, right? So someone will eventually bomb our lecture like today, Jan, perhaps, but okay, that was somehow plan somehow it was not since I don't even have his slides, but <laughs> okay. It's fun, right? So life, it's interesting because it's uh, different every day. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you don't understand, ask me. I will repeat until you get it, right? So I'm more, I'm, 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 I'm positive that eventually you you'll get everything I say, right? <laughs> At least that's my 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 hope, right? I, I will try my best. All right, first point done. Second point, uh, how the grading and stuff works, right? That's the part that some of you are super interested. I have to be honest with you in advance. And I say, I don't care. I don't care about the, the grade I'm going to be giving you. The grade is for you, right? To make GPA or things I don't care. So I will not be mean as in I will not, I will, you know, you get the grade that you want. I don't give you the grade I want. I don't care what grade I'm giving you. You should be uh, the one responsible of getting the grade you want, right? And regardless of whatever uh, the class goes, eventually you will get whatever you deserve, right? All right, so this is what your peers have done last semester, last year, actually. They were amazing. Your 
awesome tool, right? So you will contribute as well if you want to make this website and course a, even a better thing. So this is the schedule from last year and everything is recorded. As you can see, there is a video button here and I spent, you know, too many hours <laughs> putting this stuff on YouTube. Uh, anyway, so here you have all the video recordings from last year. Uh, and then here, history and motivation, you click here and you have the summary of what Jan talked about today, for, more or less, right, from, from last year. Uh, so one easy way to get three points for your final score is going to be finding typos. <laughs> if you find typos in these write-ups, you get three points, okay? Uh, I mean, yes, I'm slightly joking, slightly not. If you, you know, if you really help uh, making open so the, the code, the, sorry, the, the course a better course, then you are, you are rewarded. And everything is detailed in this document, right? Um, so, right, that's the, the last semester, uh, last year course, right? And you have also translations in, you know, Arabic, Spanish, French, Italian, Japanese, and whatever, uh, because we want to be accessible, right, to, the, to everyone. Yes, you get an A with us, you can do research with us, okay? So if you want to join Jan's lab, get an A in this course, then we can talk about joining the lab, right? But A is a prerequisite to be able to join. Uh, do we use Python? Yes, we use Python and PyTorch uh, for, for the coding part. Could we get access to the slide prior to the class? Yes, you will be able to. Whenever I know there are slides before class, today Jan bombed the class, so I didn't even know he had slides. <laughs> yes, usually you will have slides before. Uh, and all slides are online from, la from last uh, year. They are all online on the website, right? So, but I guess, yes, I will put the updated version as well. If I know there is <laughs> there are slides for a given day. Okay, so again, uh, get an A, we, talk about, we can talk about joining Jan's lab. Uh, you have the class website. Okay, so I guess we're gonna, we have what, how much time? We have like eight minutes before 10.30, okay. Uh, any material for books? And okay, I'm writing the book. The book is gonna be out in December, so not yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, does not, you don't need high skills in Python. You just need all, all you need to, to do the coding is going to be explained by me in this course. Uh, I never took a Kaggle competition, so you don't, you're not required to know what a Kaggle competition is. Uh, I, yeah. So we explained that as well. That's in a second half of the course. Um, okay. Last part. Okay. Today we don't teach, I guess it's fine. Administrative day. Fine. Cool. Uh, so, so, so again, since we are all remote, all digital, we, we are not interacting in person because there is this, you know, pandemic going on. Right. So how do I teach? Do I teach only in class? No, I also teach outside class. I'm very, uh, into teaching. Right. Uh, and so if you're interested to get additional, uh, education, uh, free of charge and you know, everyone can access this stuff. You can also find much content on Twitter, right? So if you go on twitter.com and you go slash, you put Alf and then you go C and Z, no, which is my surname sort of shortening. If you go here, you're going to see a lot of content if the website actually loads. Okay. So you can see a lot of content like this is whatever, this is like an advertisement, <laughs> leave it be. Uh, but otherwise I, I usually post other, okay, I post some food, but okay, never mind. Usually I post about uh, machine learning and okay, there you go. So this is like com math communication, right? So I, I try to push, you know, my um, educational agenda online live, right? Uh, I'm into art and education, right? So. In here, I was just talking about uh, getting life organized. Okay, this is just the beginning of the year. Uh, sorry, it's gonna be a bit uh, noisy, but usually like you have like math content. Uh, for example, here I told you, I tell you about the latest new version book of Kevin Murphy, uh, which was just released. This is a super nice book. But what I wanted to show you here was the first part, which you should really check out. It's gonna be going on the search bar. 
you want to type something like from, and then you do colon alf cnz, and then you can write, for example, linear algebra, LA, right? And so if you write LA, no, maybe let's do linear algebra, right? Linear algebra. Okay, so here uh, are very nice videos of linear algebra. And this is fundamental, okay? If you don't know linear algebra, or if you're rusting linear algebra, do check these videos out. This course is based on linear algebra. If you don't know linear algebra, then good luck <laughs> in this field, right? No, no, not just with the course. I'm just talking about generally about the field. So this is really good. Uh, it's done by Gilbert Strang. Uh, sorry, my bad. Yeah, uh, William Gilbert Strang. He's just an amazing educator. Uh, he's all as, you know, <laughs> AF, uh, but he's just amazing, right? So just check this stuff out if you don't know, if you haven't heard. Another stuff you want to see, okay, I'm talking about integral operators, you don't care. Uh, another interesting part is this one, right? So uh, this dude here, uh, Grant Sanderson, is another person which is uh, very into education. And he also makes uh, free accessible content online, uh, on this case in YouTube. And if you really don't, if you're really, really, really rusty in linear algebra, please binge watch this essence of linear algebra, okay? Everything I explain in my classes is uh, based on this perspective, right? And so if you want to get, to get started ahead, like, uh, uh, how do you say, jumpstart your, your uh, understanding of all the lectures, you may want to really binge eat these uh, videos here. You also, you can press the, the, <laughs> the heart if you want. That's appreciated. Uh, and this is gonna really help you for your uh, class, score, career, future, everything, skin. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, jokes aside, check this stuff out. It's, in, it's, it's really good, okay? I wouldn't be telling you this stuff. I don't get money out of these things. I'm just trying to be as helpful as I can. And we have three minutes left before the end of the class. Okay. All right, so enough advertisement. I just show you, um, I just show you a, a cool video, okay? And then next time we talk about PyTorch and things. Okay, so cool. The, this this is appreciated, right? So your your comments, I, I like your comments on the chat. So that makes me feel you are with me and I'm not too crazy, okay? Uh, okay, again, if you think I am, Weird, that's okay. Uh, now, if you think I am a jerk, there you go. That's not good usually. So let me know privately and I will try to be changing my something, right? But otherwise, this is me. I'm weird, uh, funny, whatever. Okay, I'm very funny. Again, don't try private messages. I, I, I can't really reply to all, all private messages, right? Okay, so last one, last bit. And that was this is gonna be the end of the class. I'm gonna be showing just a pretty video. Um, in theory, today I should have I should have shown uh, what a neural network does, right? Uh, and in, in a, usually when people talk about neural nets, the easiest thing to to think about is classification. And whenever you want to do classification, uh, when we have classification, basically it means try to sort uh, well to sort that to split things, okay, to sort things in different buckets, right? You have like pictures of a dog, pictures of a cat, pitch, pictures of a rabbit. You want to put each picture in the right bucket, right? And so what they show you usually are things like, okay, let's do this, this uh, uh, since we have the internet here, classification, right? So you want to be able uh, to use Google a lot, classic images, you know, here. Uh, okay, my internet connection sucks. No, no, classification. Okay, machine learning. <laughs> what is this stuff? Okay, there you go. So usually, okay, this is what they do, right? That, that's what they show, right? It's a straight line, okay? If it's a straight line, these two classes are called linearly separable, right? This is not usually the case. Usually what's the case is stuff is not linearly separable. Okay, let's see a picture and there is, okay. Uh, all right, there you go. Okay, this is all better, right? So these points are not linearly separable, right? So you cannot write a straight line. And so people usually show that you can have these 
boundaries, which are called decision boundaries, which are like turning, right? So I don't like this perspective because it thinks it, it makes you believe that you can turn decision boundaries in weird way. What I like to do instead, instead of having this representation, I want to warp the space such that that line is still a straight line, right? Because all we have uh, in machine deep learning and whatever is going to be a linear decision boundary, right? This is my simple singular module. So when we have a neural net, which we don't know what it is right now, but I just show you now a very cute animation, you basically see how things that are not linearly separable, see, let's see, non-linearly separable data, there you go. So whenever you have non-linearly separable, like this one, you cannot separate them with a line or, okay, a better example. Okay, this one here, for example, you cannot put a line, right? They are, they are warped. Let's, let's say like a spiral, whatever, a spiral here. So let's say you have, you have a spiral or this class is here. You cannot write a, a line through, right? You cannot cut them in half. Uh, so how do we get to classify a spiral? This looks exactly like my, my stuff. Okay. Oh, there we go here. So how do we get to write a line through this stuff? We're going to be using a network to move the space and, oh, there you go. So these are the intersection. See? Okay, this is me. So here you have a straight line, but then you cannot cut this stuff, right? And so I'm going to show you this, uh, this video about how a neural network basically morphs the space such that it becomes linearly separable. And then we're going to say goodbye. So I don't take too much of your time, <laughs> extra time. Uh, so let me open the video. This was a very interesting not planned class. And we go with this one. And we should be able to see something. So these were my original uh, five branches, right? So these are not linearly separable because if you if you turn if you if you draw lines, you're going to be intersecting uh, these classes, right? Instead, what the network does is going to be unwarp the spiral such that I can still draw lines, right? So I'm going to be showing here this animation. Uh, and next time I guess I'm going to be explaining how everything is done, right? And just showing this for making you uh, hungry. Okay. Have you had breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, uh, educationally hungry, right? What does morphing the space mean? Yes. Let next time I show, I tell you everything. Uh, this is just to show you some very cool animation. This is the stuff I like, right? Uh, also, my high schooler, uh, he has a video, so you can find out if you like, if you write from Alfkant uh, High School, you're going to find my high schooler video on YouTube as well. So I'm really into this kind of visualization, education, and in, uh, how do you call it? Uh, inter not interpretative. Uh, uh, what's it called? The, the thing you, you, in, you try to understand, right? Uh, you try to understand how it works inside. There we go. So this is basically what the network did. The network warped the space such that all the points now are spread apart. And then when these points are spread apart, they are spread apart in a specific way. This specific way is that they are now linearly separable, right? You can see, you can draw a line like this one between these yellow points and the green points. This bar is in the way. Uh, you can draw a line between the green points and the blue, uh, the purple point, and so on, right? And what are these arrows? Okay, this is a question for you, right? For next time, let me know what these arrows are. There are five arrows in two dimensions. There are five classes. And we are on a 2D screen, okay? So let me know what you think next time, right? And this is a question for you to think about. And that was basically it. We are over time as usual. Uh, sorry about that. I'm stopping the share screen. Uh, so all questions that are here and that I didn't see, I, I will not be able to answer. Just write on Campus Wire if there are, you know, uh, fundamental questions about the content. I will, we will reply. Uh, there is office hours tomorrow from Jachen, super smart guy. Um, Feedback on the class, anything. There is the campus wire chat for the feedback. That's it. Okay. Anything else? That's it.
I think we are done, right? We are late. I'm late, but it's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's okay. I think it's okay. All right. Sweet. Next time, PyTorch, we are going to be looking into this stuff. I will write you down the architecture of this network, uh, give you more context, and uh, we'll, we'll get a little bit more uh, meat, right? Like Jan took half of the class today, and then I couldn't finish. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> and I cannot even close the thing. <laughs>